Are the gastrocnemius and soleus part of a second class lever system? If you look at almost any introductory kinesiology or biomechanics book, you will see gastroc and soleus listed as part of a second class lever with a axis between the heads of the metatarsals of the foot and the floor. But gastroc and soleus also work across the ankle joints, which has its own axis. So we're going to take some time to analyze the action of the muscles at both the ankle joint and the axis between the foot and the ground. So there are typically three categories of levers. There's a first class lever, second class lever, and third class lever. And these are frequently discussed in biomechanics or kinesiology books, uh, but not so much in mechanics or physics books. Uh, just because if you can analyze the force and the axis, the lever systems don't really help out that much. And these really only apply if there are two different forces, an effort force and a resistance force. But let's first take a look at the first class lever. We have a effort force on the left and a resistance force on the right. And in biomechanics, the effort force by default is typically going to be designated as the muscle force. So it is similar to a teeter-totter where you have two people on either side of a board with an axis in the middle. So neither force necessarily has mechanical advantage. Although if you move the effort force in our diagram to the left, it will lose mechanical advantage and the resistance force will gain mechanical advantage. If you move the resistance force closer to the axis and the effort force further away, then the effort force would have mechanical advantage and the resistance force would lose mechanical advantage. Next, we have a second class lever. So this is the lever that is typically described with the soleus and gas rock acting along an axis between the foot and the ground. So we have the effort force again on the left pushing down, a resistance force to the left of the axis, but to the right of the effort force and pushing up. So our effort force is trying to create a counterclockwise rotation and the resistance force is trying to create a clockwise rotation. So they are working against each other and the effort force has more distance, so it has mechanical advantage. And this would be an analogy that you typically see compared to a wheelbarrow. Uh, so if you have an axis at the wheel, then a resistance within the wheelbarrow pushing down, and then a person on the other end with the handles pulling up, and the person would have mechanical advantage. And here we have the third class lever. And generally, most muscles and their respective joints will be classified as third class levers, and that is generally correct. In our diagram, we have the resistance force on the far left pushing up. The effort force is to the right of the resistance force, but to the left of the axis and pushing down. So the resistance force is trying to create a clockwise rotation and the effort force trying to create a counterclockwise rotation. So the resistance has the mechanical advantage and the effort force or the muscle is at a disadvantage. The analogy you, you usually see with this is with a tweezer. We have the, the resistance on the far end of the tweezer, a long distance from the axis. Uh, your fingers in the middle of the tweezer pushing down, opposing the resistance. And then the axis would be the corner or other far end of the tweezer. So this diagram is similar to what you may see in a textbook or online if you do a search for leverage of gastrocnemius and soleus. So there's an axis between the foot and the ground and typically right at the heads of the metatarsals. And then just behind that axis, a line of gravity, which may be labeled as body weight. And then we have the line of force of gastrocnemius and soleus pulling up on the calcaneus. In this diagram, I've drawn in the moment arms, which are simply a distance that represents the leverage of a specific force at an axis. So leverage is determined by the perpendicular distance of the line of force to the axis. So if I draw a line that is perpendicular to a force directly to the axis that I am analyzing and then measure that distance, that gives me the moment arm. If we take the moment arm times the force, that gives us the torque, which is the ability to rotate around an axis. So in this diagram, we have both forces on the same side of the axis, in this case, both to the right. The resistance force has a shorter moment arm. 
the muscle force or the effort force has a longer moment arm. So it appears to be a second class lever, but there are a few issues. The axis shown is relevant for balance. Only external forces are relevant for determining the balance of an object. Muscle forces are internal forces and therefore irrelevant for this analysis. An object in balance must have its line of force within its base of support. The base of support is the area where the foot contacts the ground and the line of gravity is outside the base of support in this instance, so the person is falling over. Now there is a little more to it than this. We can actually use this type of diagram to analyze uh, gastrocnemius and the leverage, but this is not the correct diagram. So let's talk a little bit about the base of support. So the base of support is defined as an area between points in contact with the ground. And for example, if you had a three-legged stool and you drew an imaginary line between the three legs, you would form a triangle. The entire area of that triangle would make up the base of support. Uh, in a 2D diagram, because we are only looking at two dimensions rather than three, the base of support is simply a line. So for our example, that base of support is between the heads of the metatarsals and the ends of the toes. As long as the line of gravity is through that base of support, then the person will not fall over. So in our diagram here, we have the line of gravity of the person, the ground reaction force pushing up, and as long as that person is static, then those forces should be opposite each other and equal to each other, and the person will be in balance. If the person was tipping backwards, they would tip over the right axis near the base of the metatarsals. If the person was tipping forwards, then they would pivot around the left axis near the ends of the toes. If the person is in equilibrium, then of course the ground reaction force and line of gravity should fall within the base of support. One simplification that is often made, and we will make it as well, is we're gonna put the line of force for the weight of the body and the ground reaction force directly through the axis at the heads of the metatarsals and the ground. In reality, the lines of force would actually be very, very close to that axis, so we're just gonna put them directly through that axis. So an analysis of the entire body at the foot ground axis would include the ground reaction force pushing up, the weight of the body pulling down, and if they are both through the axis, neither one has torque and the person is in balance. And you notice that for this analysis, the muscle force is missing. If we are analyzing the entire body, then the muscle force does not come into play in this scenario, and this is actually a complete diagram. Now on the right, we're analyzing the same axis, but we're analyzing the foot segment or the inferior segment if we're looking at the ankle complex. So now things get much more complicated. So we have the ground reaction force pushing up through the axis. We have the weight of the foot pulling down. Then we have the contact force of the rest of the body pulling down through the ankle axis, pushing down on the talus and the muscle force pulling up on the calcaneus. So we have one force that is not creating any torque and that is the ground reaction force. Then we have two forces trying to create a clockwise rotation at that axis and that is the weight of the foot and the contact force of the rest of the body, basically the entire body minus the foot. And then we have an opposing force, which is the muscle force trying to create a counterclockwise rotation around that axis. So this is a schematic of an analysis of the distal segment of the ankle complex. So if we make those few adjustments and we get rid of the ground reaction force because it goes through the axis, then we combine the weight of the foot and the contact force of the body on the talus, then we have our resistance force to the right of the axis pushing down, the muscle force further to the right of the axis pulling up, and we have our second class lever. And finally, let's analyze the ankle joint. 
Whenever analyzing forces at an axis, it's best to look at one segment at a time. So we're gonna look at the inferior segment of the ankle complex and then the superior segment. And for our purposes, the inferior segment will be the foot and the superior segment will actually be the rest of the body. So our analysis of the inferior segment at the ankle joint will include the ground reaction force pushing through the heads of the metatarsals and in this case is to the left of the axis trying to create a force into dorsi flexion. And then we have the muscle force on the right pulling up on the calcaneus into plantar flexion. Then we have the weight of the foot to the left of the axis pulling down into plantar flexion. And then finally the contact force of the rest of the body going through the talus. And since that's going through the axis, that will have no impact on uh, dorsi flexion or plantar flexion. Then on the right, we have an analysis of the superior segment. So that is all of the body except for the foot. So we have the weight of the body, excluding the foot, pulling down anterior to the axis. So that is trying to create a counterclockwise rotation of the body and the tibia on the ankle joint. So that is pulling into dorsi flexion. Then we have the muscle force pulling down on the back of the tibia and more specifically the back of the femur if we're looking at the gastrocnemius and that is pulling into plantar flexion. And then we have the contact force of the talus on the body pushing up through the ankle joint. So that will have no impact on torque as well. So we'll conclude with a simplified look at both the axis of the foot on the ground and the axis of the ankle. Again, for an analysis, you wouldn't actually look at more than one segment or more than one axis at a time, but this is a good visual, I think, to get an idea of the concept. So around the axis of the ankle joint, we have the line of force of gastrocnemius and soleus pulling into plantar flexion and the ground reaction force pushing up into dorsi flexion. And then around the axis of the foot on the ground, which is our pivot point for balance, we have the line of gravity pulling down and the ground reaction force pushing up, but both in balance.